Britain's Bird. In 2015, a rather unusual British popularity contest was launched by David Lindo, aka the Urban Birder. Unsurprisingly, the winner in 2015, as well as in the previous poll taken back in the 1960s, was the red-breasted robin, that perennial favourite that adorns our Christmas cards and frequents our gardens. However, if we look to Britain's past, it is not the robin that flies out at us from our myths and legends. The robin's popularity thinks to be thanks to the Victorians, but it instead it is the jet-black beady-eyed raven and its corvid cousins. In fact, you could go as far as to say that the raven is in many ways Britain's own power animal. The folklore and legends surrounding the corvid family, which includes crows, ravens, magpies, rooks, jackdaws and the chuff, is complex and varied. To some they are omens of good fortune, while to others they are sinister omens of doom and gloom. Crows and ravens are associated with the Irish goddess of death and sovereignty, the Morrigan, who would transform into a raven or crow and fly across the battlefield. Odin, the Viking and Saxon god of wisdom and war, had two ravens called Hugin, Thought and Moon in memory, who every day would provide him with all the information from all over the nine worlds. Yet probably the best known of the raven gods is the Welsh giant and protector of Britain, Bran the Blessed, whose name literally means raven. The story of Bran the Blessed and his sister Branwen, her name means White Raven, comes to us from the ancient Welsh text, the Mabinogion, and it is a tale that will forever be entwined with the sacredness and safety of the British Isles. Branwen was married to the Irish king Mytholoc, but he mistreated her. After a while, Branwen managed to get a message to her brother, either by a crow or starling, depending on the version, and Bran and Mytholoc went to war. During the fierce battle, Bran was injured, so he ordered his men to cut off his head and to bury it, facing the sea beneath the White Hill, so that Bran could continue to protect Britain, especially from invaders. The White Hill is where the Tower of London now stands. This is often said to be the origin of the tradition of keeping the ravens at the Tower of London, to symbolise the protection of Bran, though in reality it's probably more of a Victorian flight of fancy that drew on the old legend. It is said that if the Tower of London ravens are lost or fly away, the crown will fall and Britain with it. There was almost a panic during World War II when all but one of the ravens were killed by the trauma of the Blitz. Churchill himself ordered that more be brought in as a matter of utmost urgency. As a matter of course, six ravens are kept, along with the seventh as a reserve, and their wings are clipped to ensure that they stay local to the tower's grounds. King Arthur is also linked with ravens. This link is also found within the Mabinogion in the Dream of Renobwy. Arthur plays a game on a board against an opponent that magically plays out on the battlefield, outside with ravens and soldiers of the two opposing sides. Now, just in case you were wondering how come the Saxons, the Vikings, the Normans only managed to invade Britain if Bran's head was protecting us, well, it's all King Arthur's fault, I'm afraid. He arrogantly thought that he was such a great warrior that Britain didn't need Bran anymore, so he dug up Bran's head and thereby opened the floodgates to invaders. King Arthur also has another, somewhat bizarre link to the Corvid clan. According to Cornish legend, Arthur did not die at the Battle of Camlan, and neither was he taken off to the Isle of Avalon. Rather, he was allegedly magically transformed into a chuff, a rather lovely red-legged relation of the raven. The legends go on to say that King Arthur protects Cornwall in this form, and should the chuff ever leave Cornwall and subsequently return, as actually did happen in 2001, then King Arthur would return. So far, there's no sign of Arthur, but there are plenty of other corvids providing signs to those who know how to look for them. To Edgar Allan Poe, the raven darkly croaks nevermore. Yet to the Romans of the days of yore, the raven's croak was a message of hope, as it sounded like their word crass, meaning tomorrow. There's also a lovely superstition that if a raven lands on your house, it will be blessed with prosperity. Similarly, the arrival or presence of rooks, which was always considered fortuitous, as they put into the start of spring. However, the best known of these superstitions comes to us from the form of a well-known rhyme. Pretty much every British child grows up knowing one of the many versions of the magpie rhyme, which uses the number of magpies cited to make a prediction. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, five for silver, six for gold, seven for secret, never to be told, eight for heaven, nine for hell, and ten for the devil's own self. Corvids are all around us. They can be seen and heard flying over remote valleys or hopping along rooftops in city centres. In times past, the flight and cause of birds were used for augury by the Romans and the Druids. And indeed, there is some truth to this, for the behaviour of birds can indeed be linked to the weather conditions. Moreover, our ancestors believed that, like Odin's ravens, corvids in particular were messengers or intermediaries between the worlds, between the realms of the living and the dead. The question is, what messages are they bringing you? Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and consider subscribing. Thank you.